Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing quotient groups. Okay, so we're currently in the process of constructing the quotient group of G by N. Okay, and we discussed that to do this, what you firstly do is you take the group capital G here, which is outlined in red, and you firstly partition it up into the cosets of the normal subgroup capital N. Okay, and now we want to, con to construct this quotient group of G by M, what we're going to do is firstly construct the set of elements which is going to form this quotient group. And uh, what you're going to do is you're going to have the elements as the actual cosets, also called equivalence classes themselves. Okay, so these subsets that form a partition of the larger group, they are going to become the elements of the quotient group, basically. Okay, so you can either actually view the quotient group as having elements which are subsets of our uh, original group, capital G, as uh, I've shown here, or what you can do, and often the way that people usually do it, is you uh, give these cosets or equivalence classes names, basically, and a common notation is just to take any old representative from each one of these cosets and then put a bar above it, and that means the coset or equivalence class containing that element, basically. Okay, and then you put these symbols into a set, and these are going to be the elements of our group, but you can view it like that. Okay, just remember these are mathematical objects in their own right. They are still symbols, after all. Okay, right, so we've now got the set of elements that is going to form this quotient group, but of course a group is far more than just a set of elements. Okay, we now need a composition law, so I need to tell you how you are going to compose any two of the symbols in our set here, which is going to be our quotient group of G by N, uh, together. Okay, right. So, how am I going to define the composition law on this set of symbols then? Okay, well, quite simply, if I have two arbitrary elements of this quotient group here, okay, and let's say we've got the two arbitrary elements A bar, and I want to compose it with B bar, how am I going to define that to be? What am I actually going to define that to be equal to, basically? Well, this is how you work it out. What you do is you say, okay, we are trying to multiply together, we're trying to compose together, and I'll just colour code this in. So this composition here is our composition in this new quotient group that we have constructed here. Okay, so it's with this composition table that I am about to define, basically. Okay, so how am I going to define the composition of these two cosets then? Okay, well the way I'm going to define it is I'm going to say, okay, take a representative from each of these two cosets, okay? And obviously, the obvious representatives to go for would be the ones that we've used in the notation here, okay? So you can use the representative A and the representative B, okay? And I want you to compose these two elements together in the old group, okay? So this composition here, and I won't colour it in turquoise because that's too similar to blue, okay? I'll colour it in, in orange here. This composition here is from our original group, capital G. So basically what I'm saying is if you've got two cosets and you want to compose them together in our quotient group here, okay, what you quite simply do is you take a representative from each of the cosets, okay, so I've got a representative from A bar here, which is little a, and I've got a representative from B bar, which is little b, okay, you compose the two of them together in the old group here, you get some answer, which is A composed with B, and you then take the coset that contains A composed with B. So you take A composed with B bar. Okay, so this is how I'm going to define composition of two cosets together. Okay, so I'm going to draw a picture to show this. So let's say we've got our group here. Okay, so here is G, and now I'll draw it being partitioned up into far more cosets, basically, than I had pr in my previous picture. Okay, so we've got lots and lots of cosets, so eight in this picture. Okay, so we'll have our normal subgroup right over here, and I'll colour it in once again. Okay, so we've got the normal subgroup here, which is forming one of the equivalence classes of the partition. Okay, and now let's say we have these two cosets, A bar and B bar. So let's say A bar is here, and let's say B bar happens to be this one. Okay, so I'll colour them in as well. So here is A bar, like so, 
in purple there, and here is B bar here in turquoise. Okay, so these two cosets are represented in my quotient group here. Okay, and I'm now asking how do we compose together this purple and turquoise uh, coset? Okay, well the answer is quite simple, you take any old representative you like, and one of the first challenges we're going to have to face is how do I know that it doesn't matter which representative you take, but it will turn out that it doesn't, okay, but we haven't proven that yet. But you take any representative you like from uh, this coset A bar, okay, take any representative you like from this coset B bar, and we might as well use the notation that we've got, so A is a representative, after all the coset has been named A bar, so it must contain little a, and B is a representative of B bar, uh, because the coset is called B bar, which meant that B was an element there. Okay, so we might as well take those two. Okay, we then compose the two of them together, and we'll end up with another element, which is little a composed with little b, where this composition here is the composition in the group capital G. Okay, so this composition here is composition in our original group capital G. Okay, and the answer then is the coset that contains A composed with B, this coset yellow here. Okay, and we could call that A composed with B bar. Okay, so that is how I am defining composition of two cosets together to get another coset, which will be an element of this set. Okay, so you can go through and you can work out what the answers then are uh, to this composition table using what I've just told you. Okay, but there is one huge question that we now need to answer. Okay, the gaping hole in what I've told you. Okay, how do I know that it does not matter which representative you take within these cosets? Okay, uh, what if I have another element in this A bar coset? Okay, so here's another element. And what if I pick another element in the B bar coset? So I pick these two elements and I compose those two together. I will obviously get some different element in the group, potentially, from A composed with B. However, my claim is that it will always be in the same coset as A composed with B. So the answer in terms of cosets and what purple coset composed with turquoise coset is in my quotient group will always be the same, basically, no matter which two representatives you pick from these uh, A bar and B bar cosets. Okay, and that's the massive question that I now need to answer for you, because that is a big, big problem. Okay, so the fancy way of saying what we need to now do is we need to prove that our definition is well defined. We need to prove that there is only one answer then to what A bar composed with B bar is. And that's not trivial at all. It's not trivially obvious at all that there would only be one answer. Okay, it, from just looking at this, you could plausibly imagine that if you took two different representatives from the coset A bar and B bar, that you could end up with an answer that was in a totally different coset to A composed with B. Okay, so we need to make sure that this definition that we've just created is well defined, and this is where it becomes really important that the subgroup was a normal subgroup. Everything that we have done so far, you could have done with another uh, well, with a non-normal subgroup, okay? Uh, it, yes, it wouldn't have been the case that left um, left cosets were the same as right cosets, but you could have just said, okay, we'll use left cosets. You could have perfectly well done all of this, and you could have partitioned up the set with left cosets and create an, a, created a set with it, okay? But the composition law that I've just defined would not be well defined unless the subgroup is a normal subgroup. And this suddenly now gives us an understanding of why the definition of a normal subgroup is so, so important. Okay, because it's the thing that then makes this composition law well defined. Okay, so let's actually see why this composition law is going to be well defined. So what exactly do I want to prove? Well, what I want to prove is that if I take any other representative in the A bar coset and compose that with any other representative in the B bar coset, that I end up with another element that is in the A composed with B coset, this yellow coset over here. So basically, what I want to prove is that if I take an arbitrary element in this A bar coset, now what does an arbitrary element in the A bar coset look like? Well, of course, it will look like A composed with some element of the normal subgroup. 
because after all, what is this coset? This is the coset containing all multiples of uh, the nor elements of this normal subgroup by the element A. Now, of course, that coset is the same whether we're thinking about the left uh, coset of the normal subgroup by A or the right coset uh, of the normal subgroup by A. Okay, so it's both of them. So we might as well view it, view it as left multiplication, but you could view it as right multiplication. There's nothing to stop you doing that. I'm just going to use left multiplication. So, an arbitrary element, then, in this A-bar coset can be expressed like so. Little a composed with little n, where this little n is some element of the normal subgroup. Okay, right, so here is an arbitrary element, then, of the A-bar coset. Okay, now let me take an arbitrary element of the B-bar coset. Okay, and I want to compose a composed with n here with uh, this arbitrary element from the B-bar coset. Okay, so I'll have little b composed with little m prime for exactly the same reason. This b bar coset is, uh, you can either view it as the left coset of the normal subgroup under b or the right coset of the normal subgroup under b. They're exactly the same thing. We'll go for the left coset of the normal subgroup under b. So we'll write an arbitrary element in here as little b composed with little m prime, where again, little m prime is just some arbitrary element of the normal subgroup. So I've now got two arbitrary elements then of uh, my um, cosets here, and now I'm going to compose these two together, I'll get some answer, and I want to prove that whatever this answer is, it is within the coset of A composed with B. Okay, now what's the an arbitrary element in the uh, coset of A composed with B. Well, once again, an arbitrary element in the coset of A composed with B will be something of the form A composed with B composed with, let's say, little n double prime, basically, where little n double prime, again, is an arbitrary element of the normal subgroup. Okay, so I need to prove that whatever this answer is, it's something of this form, basically. Okay, and therefore it's within this yellow coset, and therefore the answer always has to be the same in terms of cosets. Okay, so that uh, the coset A bar composed with the coset B bar is always equal to this coset, no matter which two representatives you choose to use to work out what the two composed together is actually equal to. Okay, right, so how am I going to do this then? Well, firstly, let me just get rid of those brackets. We know that we have associativity here, so we don't need to worry about brackets, okay? Uh, we know that wherever we put the brackets, the answer is the same because we're working in a group, okay? So I'm just going to get rid of those brackets, and now we've got A composed with little n composed with little b composed with little n prime. Okay, now what I'm going to do is actually make it even more complicated. I'm going to add a bit in, and you'll see why in a moment. So what I'm actually going to stick in is I'm going to turn this into A composed with B, composed with B inverse, composed with little n, composed with little b, composed with little n prime. So which bit have I stuck in here? Okay, well here is the little a from here. And here is the little n composed with little b composed with little m prime from here. Okay, so the new bit is the b composed with b inverse. Now, why does that not make any difference at all? Well, because when you're actually working this out, of course, you do have to put brackets in. And we know because of associativity, it doesn't matter where you put brackets in. So we could put the brackets around b composed with b inverse, and that would just give the identity. And of course, the identity wouldn't make any difference to what this composition was equal to. Uh, so we'd be back here. So this actually doesn't make any difference to this at all. Okay, now why is that a clever thing, however, to do? Because what I can do is I can put brackets instead around the b inverse inverse composed with little n composed with little b. Okay, so I hope I've convinced you now that this is equal to this, so I can do this leg legitimately. Okay, I haven't um, uh, broken it in any way, I've just done a fancy trick. Okay, now you'll see why it's a useful fancy trick. Okay, because I can group those things together, and now what have I got there? I've got little b inverse composed with little n composed with little b, okay? I am conjugating an element of the normal subgroup 
by an element of the group, namely B inverse. You can think of this as B inverse composed with little n composed with B inverse's inverse, okay, because little b is the inverse of B inverse, okay, so I really am conjugating this element of the normal subgroup by um, B inverse, basically, which is an element of the group, so I'm doing exactly this, okay, little b inverse is filling in for G here, and I'm just conjugating an element of the normal subgroup by that element B inverse, and because this is a normal subgroup, we know that whatever this answer is, it has to be another element of the normal subgroup. Okay, so what can I call this? So now let's call this element little n triple prime, let's say. Okay, so whatever this is, you can work it out and it's some other element of the normal subgroup. We'll call it n triple prime. Okay, so now what I can rewrite this as is a composed with b composed with little n triple prime, composed with little n prime. And now it should be obvious what I can do. I can just group these two things together, okay, and say, right, when I multiply little n triple prime here with little n prime, I'm going to get some other element of the normal subgroup, and this now is my element n double prime. Okay, so I have successfully rewritten this as a composed with b composed with some n double prime, which is an element of the normal subgroup, which is exactly the form of something in the coset of a composed with b, basically. Okay, so that is a a fancy argument, there's this fancy trick that you might not think of, of sticking in the B and B inverse there. But what we have just proven, basically, is that if you take any other element of the uh, coset A bar here, okay, any other element apart from A, and you use that as your representative rather than little a, and you take any other element of this coset B bar here, okay, um, so the little b composed with n prime here, okay, and you use that as your representative, then if I want to multiply these two cosets together in my quotient group, what I need to do is compose the two representatives that I've got here together in the old group, which I'm doing here, and I need to show that that answer will give us the same answer as what we got when we used little a and little b as our representatives, basically. I.e., it will give the same coset as the answer, so I need to prove that whatever this is, it is an element of the coset a composed with b bar, which I have just done because I've shown you that this can be rewritten as a composed with b composed with some n double prime here, which is an element of the normal subgroup, which is exactly the form that things will be in if they're in this coset uh, a composed with b bar. Okay, so what I have just shown you is that truly, if you use this way of multiplying together two cosets, of picking representatives from those cosets, multiplying them together in the old group, capital G, getting an answer and then taking the coset that contains that answer, and then that's the answer to the two cosets multiplied together, okay, it truly does not matter which two representatives you pick, and therefore this is a truly well-defined um, way of defining the composition law, basically. So there could only ever be one answer in each of these slots of the composition table. It is well defined. Okay, if different people did this and worked out the composition table, they would get the same answer, even if they all picked different representatives from the cosets. Okay, so that's very reassuring. Okay, so now we've proven it's well defined and we've proven that everyone would get the same answer if they did it. What we now want to prove is that it actually obeys the axioms of group theory. We want to prove that this composition law does obey the axioms of group theory. Okay, but we'll call it there for this video and we'll do that proof in the next video.